Diverticular disease is about the complications from diverticulosis. So I want to start off with diverticulosis and then work our way up the chain in terms of severity of disease. So this is like a colon. And a diverticula is literally just an outpouching of the mucosa. You can imagine the colon has been squeezing against stool your entire life. And over and over and over again, it just squeezes and squeezes and squeezes against constipated stool. And eventually it just squeezes so hard, it pop, a piece pops out. That outpouching is a diverticula. Now usually, the type of person who gets this has constipation and has it for a long time. This is usually in people who are over 50 years old who have constipation. So those who are going to have diets that are poor in fiber and vegetables, but rich in red meat. A Western diet makes you apt to get diverticula. But diverticulosis is asymptomatic. Patients don't even know they have it. They don't know they have it unless they get screened for something else or they end up with one of the complications, which we'll talk about in a minute. Since they're over 50, they should be screened for colon cancer. And on colonoscopy is how you often find the diverticula. You may also find them on a CT scan done for something else. But don't do a CT scan if you're looking for diverticulosis. You should do only a screening colonoscopy looking for colon cancer and you'll find the diverticula. And because they are asymptomatic, there's no treatment. You just want to prevent them progressing into some of these complications, so you put them on a high fiber diet. And of course, you'd want to prophylax this by maintaining a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables. But one of these outpouchings, so remember the person who has Diverticulosis probably doesn't have that great of a diet to begin with or has another risk factor for constipation. Every time a patient eats, the gastrocolic reflex kicks in. There's a mass movement. This is a person who's already got constipation. A mass movement contracting against hard stool where there's already diverticuli is just going to cause pain. So I call this diverticular spasm. The new name you'll see it listed under is symptomatic, uncomplicated diverticulosis. These diverticula have a pang or a twang of pain as they contract. So the patient is going to present with a postprandial left lower quadrant abdominal pain, relieve the bowel movement. This sounds a lot like irritable bowel disease pain relieved by a bowel movement. And like irritable bowel disease, this is a clinical diagnosis. Remember, the person who gets diverticular spasm is going to be the same person who gets diverticula. So they're going to be older than 50. And in general, the person who gets irritable bowel disease is going to be younger, 18 to 25, and generally female. The treatment for this is high fiber diet. The idea being if you don't have constipated stools, maybe it won't squeeze so hard. But now we're going to get into the more severe complications, the one that can actually cause some problems and cost someone their life. You can imagine that these diverticula, these outpouchings, get stretched every once in a while, just in the natural contractions that are going on. If one of these diverticula happens to have an arterial at the top, and it gets stretched, it can bleed. The patient with a diverticular hemorrhage will present with painless hematochesia. And at this point, when they're presenting to you with painless hematochesia, you don't know if it's a hemorrhoid, you don't know if it's a brisk upper GI bleed. All you know is painless, bright red blood per rectum. 
They might be over the age of 50. You might even know they have diverticula, but you have no idea what the cause of this GI bleed is. So you're going to treat them like a GI bleed. We talk about this later in the GI bleed lecture, but, but you're going to give this person two large bore IVs, infuse them with normal saline or lactated ringers, type in cross transfuse as needed, call GI, and give intravenous PPI. They're probably going to get an endoscopy, an EGD. Not what they need at all. But what you're going to do is treat them like a GI bleed, rule out the GI bleed the way you normally do it, and then end up with, oh, okay, so it's probably lower. Once you've ruled out everything else, you're going to get either a colonoscopy or an arteriogram. You're going to get a colonoscopy after the bleeding is done. It self-resolves. person doesn't die. They're not constantly hemorrhaging. Bleeding stops. Do a colonoscopy. There's nothing in here but some diverticula. So you presume it's diverticular hemorrhage. Or on the other hand, they're bleeding out and they constantly bleed. They keep bleeding. You keep transfusing them, but they keep on bleeding. Then you get the arteriogram. What the arteriogram allows you to do is embolize. You simply cut off the bleeding vessel and the bleeding stops. And the last, the most severe of the disease, is going to be what happens when a fecal lift forms across one of these diverticula and we get a perforation. So much like in appendicitis, a fecal lift forms in one of these diverticula, and bacteria set up shop. Now, every form of diverticulitis is technically a perforation, but you have to decide, is it micro or macro? That is to say, do they just have a little bit of inflammation in their colon? Have they broken through the wall, but it's still contained? That's an abscess. Or have they full-on ruptured and they've got pus and stool in their peritoneal cavity? The patient who presents with diverticulitis is going to present with a left-sided appendicitis. It is going to be a constant left lower quadrant abdominal pain. There will be fever and leukocytosis. indicating that there's inflammation, and the person is going to be tender, but all on the left lower quadrant. The first thing you could do is get an upright KUB to rule out perforation. You see free air under the diaphragm, they go to surgery. But the way you diagnose diverticulitis is going to be with a CT scan of the abdomen, CT IV contrast. And that's going to also allow you to grade the severity. And how severe it is also helps you determine how you treat them. Now, it's not just the appearance on the CT scan. What I'm going to talk about is not that bad, abscess, and full-on perf. And you're going to be able to see that based on the results of the CT scan, knowing that what you're actually going to do is take a look at the picture in general as a whole. How bad are they? How sick are they? How septic? What's their blood pressure, etc. But let's keep it simple. You're going to have mild disease, you're going to have severe disease, abscess, perf, and refractory. In mild disease, they go on a liquid diet and they try oral antibiotics. For the severe, severe disease, they are NPO and they get IV antibiotics. These people get admitted. An abscess is like severe, NPO, IV antibiotics, but they need to be drained. All abscesses need to be drained. Perfs go straight to surgery, of course, with antibiotics. And the person who keeps getting diverticulitis over and over and over and over again, usually after the second time, you start talking about cutting out the colon. You're going to treat the acute diverticulitis just as if it were a new diverticulitis because it's a new inflammation, mild, severe, abscess, perf. But then once you're done with the treatment, after two or more times that this happens, you really want to think about doing a hemicolectomy.
So what antibiotics should you use? You're covering for gut flora. Gut flora can be covered with Cipro and metronidazole, or the combination of gentamicin, ampicillin, and metronidazole. What you will see done often on the wards is Piptazo. Piptazo will always be wrong on the test because that's what everyone does in practice. Okay, because diverticulitis is such a big deal, I want to close by doing it again. So someone comes in with the left lower quadrant abdominal pain. And it's tough to say, but you can probably skip the KUB because the CT scan is going to be enough. But if you just do the KUB, what you'll see is one of three things. You will either see that this person has free air, and that's a perforation. It doesn't matter that they've got diverticulitis. They're perfed. They need an X-lap. They go to surgery and IV antibiotics. If instead you see loops of small bowel and air fluid levels, that's an obstruction. That goes to surgery. Doesn't necessarily need antibiotics. But if what you see is nothing, neither free air nor loops of small bowel, that's all a KUB is good for, perforation and obstruction, then you have the CT scan. The CT scan of the abdomen with IV contrast, and it's going to separate it out into mild, severe, and abscess. And the reason why I say you could skip the KUB altogether is because the CT scan is going to show you perforation or obstruction as well. But if given the option between them, I would pick the KUB first because it's cheaper, especially if the person were ill. Mild disease, liquids, oral antibiotics, ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, severe NPO, IV antibiotics, ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, abscess, NPO, IV antibiotics. Brain. And that is diverticular disease.